Renee, I know you have a hard week, but you still, your fashion is on point. I just want you to know. I was looking at your outfit up here. And first of all, I want you to know that you are the one who's inspired me to wear these kinds of heels. So I like, and whenever I see these, I think of her because they're like preaching heels. But then I noticed that the banner was matching your dress. So do they like color coordinate with the leader's outfits to look good? It worked. It worked really well. All right, so good to be with you all again on Mother's Day. And um, actually two of the three best reasons for making me a mother are here. And I'm gonna make my daughters stand up. Faith and Ellie Grace, will you guys just stand up right now? These are my daughters. Couldn't be prouder of them. They're amazing. And my son, my oldest son, he's in the Navy right now. So he's in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. He actually remembered to text me. So I feel like you have to somewhat of a mom win right there, right? Like when your sons who are grown up and they remember to text you without any, I don't know, maybe you guys texted him like, remember it's Mother's Day. Um, okay, so yes, I'm gonna be speaking today on uh, something that actually... It was kind of God's idea because about five years ago, we were at, um, for those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Bethany Hicks. I'm co-founder of Prophetic Company with Dan and Regina McCollum. And so we are just helping people recognize and respond to the voice of God as a prophet, but also as a prophet, I feel like there's a call and a mandate on my life to um, really redefine what kingdom mothering is. And so about five years ago, we were um, currently serving at the Mission Church in Vacaville, California. <clears throat> and I was asked to preach on Mother's Day. First time I was asked to preach at the mission, you know, like token woman on Mother's Day. And um, can I just say, I'm so thankful that this house fully embraces the voice of mothers and fathers equally. It's actually not as common as you would think. And I just have a conviction that you can't have the full voice of the father expressed without mothers and fathers, without men and women. And so I'm just grateful that this house really fully, not only embraces it in word, but in action. And so five years ago, I was asked to speak on Mother's Day um, and preach on that Sunday. And so it was interesting because I, because it was Mother's Day, I was focusing on that topic and I was processing about how I would receive these prophetic words about like, you know, you're, you're a lightning rod, you're a pioneer, you're a forerunner, you're blazing trails and all these super powerful words that I identified with. And then I would get these words like, and you'll be known as a mother. And I would cringe inside, like not because I don't love being a mother in the natural to my three amazing children, but I knew it was talking about something more than just biological mothering, which is awesome. But it was also talking about kingdom mothering or spiritual mothering. And in my mind, I had this idea that I would get these powerful words, but then I would get this word that honestly, to me, mothers or mothering in the church felt like a second class citizen. It was kind of like, like there's a lot that I believe is, is embraced and celebrated as it should be about fathers and fathering. And even in the last decade, I believe there's been, the Lord has really been highlighting what fathers are, what they carry, why we need them. I love that Chris Valentin is going after this right now, the fatherlessness of the generation and raising up healthy men to be fathers. But there has been a deafening silence in the church about what a kingdom mother carries. And as a result of that Sunday, I started to ask the Lord, like, Lord, what is it that a mother carries that's uniquely and distinctly different than what a father carries? And so I, I dove into the scriptures because I needed to know for myself, like, God, if you're calling me a kingdom mother, then what is that? What makes a mother different than a father other than her gender? Right? Like every single role or name or title that is given to you, there is an authority and there is a responsibility attached to those names, to those titles. So 
okay, we're getting an idea of what fathers carry. You know, they're protectors, they're providers. They call out identity. What does a mother carry? And why do I need it to know not only for myself, but also I just needed to know so I could step into it more fully from the Lord. And so I stepped into this message and I knew when I first preached it, I felt like the Lord gave me some keys and I'm gonna share some of those with you guys today. But I... Um, I knew in the moment that I shared that message that it was bigger than just that Sunday. And I didn't know why. Some of you guys have heard this story, but I just felt like the message was, was different. And then two months later, uh, we were at School of the Prophets. It was kind of like the second time I was there. I was part of the team with, with Dano and Dano and Chris Valentin, of course, uh, co-founded School of the Prophets. So last minute, I was invited to be on a Q&A panel with Chris and Dano only. So it's just the three of us, right? Nobody knows who I am. They just know I'm a woman on the panel with these two prophetic friends fathers. And so they're asking these questions about the prophetic. I'm trying to hold my own a little bit. And then they did reserve this one question for me, which was, what's it like to be a woman in a man's, what's it like to be a woman prophet in a man's world? Which was a great question. In that moment, I knew the Lord wanted me to share just a couple highlights from this kingdom mothering message. And I just like, I felt something come on me and share it in that moment. And it was pretty crazy. Actually, when I was, when, when I finished, I think I ended up with something like, and women just need to own it or something. And the whole place just erupted in applause, standing ovation, really awkward. It was like, like, honestly, like they just kept clapping and clapping. And I remember looking over at Chris and he's smiling at me like, I see you for the first time. Like he saw something, you know, Dan was like, mic drop. And then Chris got up and he prophesied over me. He said, you're going to write the book that redefines mothering in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to write the forward and I'll get Bill Johnson to write a uh, um, an ex endorsement. And he did. He totally did that. He made that happen. So that's what, that's what, was produced here was this book called Own Your Assignment, which I'm gonna, again, share briefly a few keys. Now, I wanna say this because I don't want you to check out. I don't want any of the men to check out in here. And I don't want any of the women who either don't have biological children or are not married yet or are currently not or single. I don't want you to check out thinking this message is not for you because you guys, every single son and daughter needs a mother. And you know, every one of us have women in our lives that are sisters that are mothers, that are daughters. And so this message just shows how we can connect with one another. But again, I believe that every woman is called to this assignment of kingdom mothering. Um, again, whether you've had biological children or you haven't, whether you are single or whether you're married, whether you're a grandmother, whether again, you've, you're older and you've never had children, it doesn't matter because I believe in this season of harvest, the billion soul harvest is coming and now is, amen? We're, start, we're gonna see it, you guys. We're starting to see this. I, and what's happening is all these orphans are coming into the kingdom of God. They're now called sons and daughters, but they don't know how to live as sons and daughters. They need fathers and mothers to show them who God has created them to be. This assignment is for every woman and fathers and mothers are needed in this time as never before. Come on, you guys. How many of us know that there is an identity crisis happening today in this generation, right? And I wanna, I wanna propose to you that this is a spiritual problem that needs a heavenly solution to it, right? And... Uh, we know that the enemy hates all mankind, right? The devil hates all mankind, but I would even propose that he especially hates women. You know why? It actually goes back to the Garden of Eden. In, um, after the fall, it's interesting. So after the fall of sin, Adam and Eve ate the, ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we know sin came into the world. So then God comes and he starts to speak to, he speaks to, this, to Satan, to the devil, to um, Eve and then to Adam, right? He, he kind of speaks over them what's gonna happen. But I want you to hear this because I kind of thought of this yesterday as I was putting this together. This is the first promise for mankind after the fall, 
okay? And here it is, and it might not sound like, sound like one, but this is what's happening. Genesis 3, 14 to 15. So God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. Here it is. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, that's the offspring of the women, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That word enmity is hatred, okay? So God is saying there is going to be a hatred between you and the woman and her offspring is going to crush your head. Okay, well, now we know that this is prophetically uh, foreshadowing Jesus, but guys, I think it's much bigger than that. Like it's all, it's about the sons and daughters of God. See, there is a reason why women in general have been suppressed, minimized, and diminished for thousands of years and enslaved for thousands of years. And this is not a feminist statement. This is just a statement of fact. It is because there is a hatred of the devil that he has for women specifically. Why? Because when women become mothers, both in the natural and the spiritual, their offspring crushes the head of the enemy. So it's interesting that I, there are three things that the Lord is seeking. I used to think there was only two, but actually I just saw this the other day. There's actually three things scripture says that the Lord is seeking. Now, we know that God has all wisdom, all glory, all power. Everything belongs to God. So what could he possibly want? What could he possibly be seeking? And scripture says there's three things. He's seeking the lost, right? To seek and to save the lost. He's seeking true worship, true, wor true worshipers, right? And thirdly, in Malachi 2.15, it says this, and what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. Okay, I'm trying to set the stage for why, what's happening, and, and, and for us to have spiritual eyes so that we can, again, address it through that kingdom mothering and fathering assignment. So why is God seeking godly offspring? Again, this goes back to the original Genesis mandate for all of mankind. In Genesis 128, God said, be fruitful and increase in number, right? So that mankind can fill the earth so they can rule and have dominion over every living thing, right? We can't take dominion if there's nobody to rule. And mankind must fill the earth through godly offspring. I'm speaking, I'm not just speaking procreation here, although honestly, that's a very important part of this, guys. It really is. We're talking about godly offspring. This godly offspring is what crushes Satan's head by manifesting God's kingdom on the earth. See, the enemy hates all mankind, I believe, and especially women, but this is his strategy. This is his target. He goes after the children. Are you seeing this? Think about this, guys. He hates women and he especially hates her offspring because the promise is the offspring is what's gonna crush his head. It's what's gonna crush the works of the enemy on the earth. So he is going to do everything possible to stop offspring from coming forth. Right? Roe v. Wade, 50 years of abortion. He was trying to stop the godly offspring from coming forth. And as, and, and of course, I, and I said this last time I was here, but it was like, do you realize that the overturning of Roe v. Wade, it is not a coincidence that the rise of this gender confusion, the rise of self-mutilation, the rise of what's happening right now with children, that they're trying to mutilate their bodies, to change their bodies into something else. You know, what's, you know what that, that, that's not a coincidence. He's still targeting the children. I'm so thankful that Texas just passed SB 14. I know. Yeah, Texas! Thank you, Jesus!
For those who don't know, SB 14 is a law or bill that was just passed to prevent minors in Texas from being allowed to have transgender surgery, uh, castration, and mutilation of their bodies. Like my daughters can't even get their ears pierced without me signing a permission slip. And this was something that was actually, the fact that we even have to make laws about it is crazy. But you know, abortion, of course, we know killed, and I, again, you guys, I hope you're hearing me. I know that there's people in this room that, that had abortions. I understand this is not about shame. This is, God has so much forgiveness and goodness and he is so kind and he's so loving. And those children are with him right now and you will see them again. I know that, okay? I know that. But I'm, I want you to see a bigger view of what's happening right now, a spiritual view, and what I believe is one of God's heavenly solutions for this. So again, we know that abortion killed offspring before they could be born. But honestly, you guys, what's happening right now with this, the mutilation and the castration, it's producing the same effect. Have you thought about that? Because if children have their ability to produce offspring removed, think about this. In about 20 years, we would have an androgynous population, androgynous generation, and we cannot fulfill God's mandate if we're not increasing and filling the earth to subdue it. Yeah. Amen? So um, I heard this the other day. It was interesting. Um, Tucker Carlson, he's a journalist, but he made this comment that shocked me. He was talking about how... Um, I'm really not going to camp here much longer, but I just, again, I'm trying to show you guys culturally where we're at here. He talked about how abortion essentially is not a, it's not a political issue. It's a theological issue. It's basically child sacrifice. And he talked about, this was what he said though. He said, there has never been a society in history that did not practice child sacrifice. He's like, and I, and he said he researched it. The enemy hates mankind, especially women, but his strategy, the target, is going after the children, guys. So even today, you know, the, the political, some of our governmental leaders trying to change the terms of women to menstruating person and mother to birthing person. Did you guys know that? It's insane, you know, and it's so much more than just semantics. They're trying to completely redefine women and mothers. Why wouldn't they go after men? Because the enemy hates women, and especially hates mothers. I believe there is a movement of kingdom mothers rising up today as a kingdom response to what is happening in this current identity crisis. As I said before, the, the harvest is coming and there is an urgency. I believe there is an urgency for fathers and mothers to rise up and to stand in the gap, to be an answer and a solution to what is happening today, you guys. You know, it's not going to be a political program. It's not going to be an educational agenda. It's not even going to be a medical breakthrough that's going to be the solution to what's happening today, although all those things will be helpful. It is going to be about fathers and mothers stepping into their role to raise up the next generation as sons and daughters of God so that we can fulfill the original mandate that God gave us. Amen. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what is the assignment, I believe, of a kingdom mother. Well, First of all, it all comes around vision. And I believe Psalms 112, one through two, is a key to this vision. It says, blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Okay, I love this passage. It is the children of the righteous who will be mighty in the land. It is the children who are the champions of our generation. It's not necessarily the, the warriors or the, the trained, qualified people, the, the highly educational ones. You know, it's not like the strongest of the strong. It's actually the children who are the game changers of the earth. And you can't have children without mothers and fathers. So even as I'm sharing today, you guys, about this kingdom mothering assignment, again, I, it can be applied both in the natural, but it also is to be applied in the spiritual because we need every, all we need all hands on deck. Amen. So, okay, kingdom mothers, 
What is the vision? I would say very simply it's this, to raise up and release world changers. That would be the assignment of a kingdom mother is to raise up and release world changers. And I realize that world changers, that term is a bit of a buzzword right now. Um, We hear it kind of thrown around a lot, but you guys, this is the truth. When you change your world, you change the world. I'm gonna say that again. When you change your world, you change the world. They did this study in 2019. The the National uh, Royal Geographic Society of London did this study and they concluded that the most important living being on the planet are bees. They're bees. Because what bees do is their work as, as going from flower to flower and pollinating, right? And how it affects the ecosystem, which then affects the, the rest of the ecosystem. And it continues to domino. Without their work, without what they are called to do, if, they were, if there were no bees on the planet, I, I think there's something like within four days, there would be no vegetation. And within two weeks, there'd be no life. It's crazy, Like bees are considered the most important living being on the planet. Now think about it. This little bee doesn't think that it's going around to change the world, right? It's like I'm just going to the flower to do what I was created to do. But it didn't realize that its little part was affecting that little part, which was affecting that little part, which is affecting this part, which affects the whole world, right? So again, world changer is not a buzzword. It just said this in Psalms 112, that the children will be mighty in the land. That sounds like a world changer to me. So when you change your world with who God has created you to be, then you will change the world. So I'm going to give you guys today four keys to raising world changers, which I believe is uh, something that is is really assignment of a kingdom mother. And um, hopefully you guys will be inspired, encouraged, and honestly, just ready to sign up, right, for this kingdom movement. So um, again, so the vision for mothering is to raise up world changers. So the, so the uh, first key is this, to model the vision. I believe that kingdom mothers are called to model the vision. And it, and it looks like this. The best way to raise a world changer is to be one yourself, Mothers need permission for this, you guys. Okay, let me, let me kind of share with you a principle in the natural realm that actually uh, affects even the spiritual realm. So in Genesis, when God created all of creation, the trees, the animals, the plants, everything, you'll notice that as he created in Genesis 1, he said the trees and the animals produced after its own kind, right? So like produces like. If I plant an apple seed, I will get a apple tree, right? If an elephant gives birth, what is it giving birth to? An elephant, exactly. Good job, everyone. (laughs) So we're talking about like produces like. World changers produce world changers. Are you starting to see this? You cannot model a world changer mindset to those you are influencing if you're not living it first. And, um, and there's this principle in creation. Now, first of all, in Romans 1.20, it talks about how God's eternal power and divine nature can be clearly seen through what has been created, right? So what that's saying is that we can recognize God's nature, his character, his ways through patterns in creation, through the actual thing that was created itself, right? And so um, one of the patterns in creation, which I found fascinating, is called imprinting. Imprinting is where like a baby animal is born and like maybe a baby duck or something like that. And within like, I don't know if it's hours or maybe a couple days, it will imprint or bond with a parent within that short window of time. And when it bonds, it will then be imprinted, allow that thing to shape how it becomes right? So a mama duck or a papa duck, they're going to show the baby duck how to be a baby duck, right? And so um, they even see this like principle, for example, with eagles. So when eagles are born, little baby eaglets, and they're in their nest, okay? Imagine them in this big nest. When they learn how to fly, 
Uh, their mothers don't kick them out of the nest as popular to contrary belief. That's not what happens. Actually, one of the ways that eaglets learn how to fly is their, what will happen is their parents every day will go out and get food. And when they come back, the parents will circle and fly over the nest and just fly over the nest. And the eaglets are watching their parents soar. They're watching how they do it. They're watching how their wings are moving. And so as they're watching them, they're learning how to be become what they were created to be, right? So even as mothers, we inspire others to soar by soaring the heights ourselves. Um, We see this principle of imprinting spiritually with Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 1.5. Paul, his his spiritual father, is speaking to Timothy and he says this. I want you guys to catch this principle of like producing like of this imprinting. It says this, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, here it is, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Okay, here's Lois, grandmother Lois, first of her kind, first of her generation, right? Some of you guys are first generation believers. You guys are paving a new trail for generations to come in your family line, okay? That's what Lois did. So here's Lois, and she had a faith with the Lord, a faith for the Lord that was unshakable, and she treasured that. She was soaring with that faith with the Lord. As a result, she imprinted that faith. She reproduced that in her daughter, Eunice, right? Because it got passed down to Eunice. Eunice sees her mom. Now Eunice is like, this faith is mine. So now Eunice starts operating in that same faith for the Lord. And she's, she's walking in that. And then it doesn't stop there because then Eunice then imprints it or passes that down to her son, Timothy. And Timothy receives that as well. Are you guys catching this? And Timothy, of course, passes it to all of us because we have two books of his Bible, two books in, in, in the Bible, right? So do you see how this is passed down? Um, Marie Curie, she discovered radioactivity. She was the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize. The first person, both man or woman, to, will, to win two Nobel Prizes um, as well. But it didn't end there. Her oldest daughter, Irene, followed her example and also won a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1935. See, I believe as mothers, we model not only what is necessary, but what is possible. World changers reproduce after their own kind. In my family, um, I, my great grandfather was a circuit rider preacher, and so he would he would play his guitar and preach and go from town to town on his horse in the Midwest and just go around. He was a circuit rider preacher, and then my gra- my grandparents were all um, ordained ministers under Amy Simple McPherson. And so, yeah, it was so cool. And they all loved to worship. Like they were all in music. They all were worship leaders. You know, I learned my first instrument really was tambourine with my grandma in the front row. <laughs> I, could, I could play a mean tambourine right now. She was probably one of those people that as a worship director, I'd be like, could you not play on Sunday morning anymore? But um, so my grandparents were all worship leaders. And then my parents, I remember growing up watching my parents. My mom was the chief piano player at our church. My dad played the trumpet. Occasionally they would um, lead worship and stuff. But there was always like worship playing at my house. So this, this value for worship and worshiping the Lord was actually being passed down from generation to generation. So as a result, my parents, all three of their children were worship pastors, um, which was not planned. My brother, my sister, and I were all worship pastors for over 20 years. And, and it didn't stop there, you guys, because my sister, all three of her kids, in fact, my niece is here right now, all three of my sister's children are actively involved in worship and worship leading, playing, playing drums. Are you catching this? And then for me, even in my own heart, my own children are growing in it. My daughter, Faith, is now leading worship at, uh, she's growing and leading worship. She's, um, I can't even tell you, we saw the Jesus Revolution movie and the first thing she wanted to do was go home and worship. I'm like, yes, thank you, Jesus. Well, what's happening? They're watching 
They're watching their mothers and fathers and what they value, and that is what's getting imprinted onto them, and that gets passed down from generation to generation, you guys. What you model, both good and bad, will get passed on, right? So again, my family's imprinting a legacy of worship for generations, and, and, and that is something we all get to do. So even for some of you right now, just process with the Lord. Lord, what is it that I am passing down? And it's okay if you haven't started yet. Now's the day, right? Like just understanding, like, what do I want to pass down? What do I want to see being imprinted to those that I'm called to mother and father? Can I just encourage you women right now? One of the greatest disservices that you can do for those you are mothering is to live a powerless life. And I get it. As women, especially, we tend to be like, uh, we tend to make ourselves last for everything. And, and I understand that there's a value for sacrifice. And I'm not saying that we don't do that. But I want to say that there is a call of God on every single one of your life. And if you don't model following who God has created you to be, how are those that your mothering and father going to feel the permission to do the same? So we must not live that powerless life. So again, the first key there is that we want to model the vision and the best way to raise a world changer is to be one. You guys okay? Okay, awesome. Our second key is to affirm the vision. Okay, affirm the vision. Again, I go into detail much more in my book, but um, this was interesting because Mary's uh, mothers carry, I believe, a unique ability to see and treasure the gifts and callings of God in their children. And there's many biblical mothers that model this, but I'm gonna highlight Mary right now, the mother of Jesus. So you guys remember when Mary had Jesus, she's in the manger. I mean, they're in the, they're in the, uh, yeah, they're in there. And, and, um, and the shepherds come, they proclaim this amazing word that the angels just said, you know, the wise men are giving the treasures. And what's interesting is that the scriptures say, while everyone was amazed, it says in Luke 2, 19, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Okay. That word pondered means treasured. She treasured those things in her heart. That word treasured uh, in the Greek means to preserve a thing to keep within oneself so it doesn't get lost. To treasure literally means that we keep the vision of who God has created them to be before us and preserve it at all costs, lest the vision become lost or forgotten. This means that no matter what the outward circumstances are, and trust me, I know, my kids were young. I mean, I, I get there can be some challenging circumstances where every, every ounce of their behavior is in the opposite of who God has called them to be. I get it. But as mothers, I believe we let that be the lens through which we see them. Okay, that is constantly the thing that we are treasuring. It's constantly, because I believe if that vision is lost, so is the possibility for it to be realized. Um, and so that, what does that look like potentially, practically? My youngest daughter, Ellie, uh, she just turned 16 a couple of days ago. My baby's driving, oh my gosh. And um, it was interesting, when I was um, pregnant with her, I didn't know what her gender was yet. I was actually at Bethel and Reading and um, one of the pastors on staff, I didn't know them, but they came up and they gave me this word over this child I was carrying, how they would have an audience, that they would blaze a trail and they would have an audience behind, uh, that would be watching them, that would be following them. And so I've always kind of like watched that word as a mother, right? This is the vision. This is who God is calling her to be. Um, and so I've been kind of watching her over the years. She's incredibly gifted at everything creative. She can sing, she can dance, she's very artistic. Um, and then about when she was, I think, 10, Chris Valentin actually was at our church in the mission. I didn't really know Chris yet at the time. He did a word of knowledge call out for um, someone named Ellie, uh, someone's daughter who was named Ellie, and I was the only one. So he prophesied this word that was right on, but one of the things he talked about was how that she would be like Amy Simple McPherson where she used evangelism with the arts and he saw acting and he saw this stuff on her. Okay, these are powerful words that I have been literally treasuring you guys for years. 
years. One of the reasons we moved to Texas two years ago was so that she could start stepping into acting at Cedar Ridge High School because this is something that she has been choosing. We just went to a comedy improv showcase with her the other night. You guys, I mean, I'm just gonna brag on my kid for a second, but she was on there more than any other of her classmates because she is so anointed and so good at what she's doing as a sophomore. She's already getting the attention of the teachers and the instructors as well as her peers. And just as a mother, this is, this is what I want to share with you. I'm affirming the vision because I'm treasuring these things in my heart. When she shares this feedback, I'm like, okay, God, you said that she had a call and I'm starting to see the seeds of this call come forth. And to be honest, I think I needed those prophetic words more than she did because as I don't know that I would have let her walk into acting uh, because it's a tough world right? We know that Hollywood can be really hard, but because I have the prophetic words of who God has called her to be, it's actually allowing me to treasure and look at her through the lens. I'm not pushing her, but I am supporting her so that I can watch and see who she is as she steps into her call. So this is, again, some practical ways that we can affirm the vision both for our natural um, our, our natural and our uh, spiritual children. Okay, our third principle is to assist the vision. And um, assisting the vision is really about the prophetic nature, I believe, of, that a mother carries. And, um, you know, children, spiritual and natural, are what makes a woman a mother, right? Right? And, but, but they're not the only sphere of influence or metron that a woman has, right? But it does mean that mothers are uniquely positioned because, to come alongside and strengthen, encourage, and build up their children, right? And so what does that look like? We see an example in, um, I'm just going to share just a component of the strength part of, we see this with Deborah in Judges, where Deborah, who was called a mother of Israel, do you realize Deborah, who is a prophet and a judge, was called the mother of Israel. She was literally raising up a generation of world changers. She was raising up a nation of world changers. And so one of the components of mothering is that prophetic nature. Remember 1 Corinthians 14.3 that says that prophecy is to um, encourage, strengthen, and comfort, right? Mothers are uniquely positioned to encourage, strengthen, and comfort those that they're mothering. So in Judges 5.7, here's Deborah called the mother of Israel. And Barak, who is her commander in, in chief, he's the one who's a general of her armies. She tells him, hey, I want you to go out and, to, um, and go into battle and take down Israel's oppressor. Go, the Lord is with you. Now, this is interesting because uh, Barak had, had a little bit of an issue. And we see this in Judges 4, 8 through 9. He says this, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will gladly go with you, but you will receive no honor on the road you're about to take because the Lord will sell Sisera to a woman. Sisera was the evil general. So Deborah got up and went with Barak. Okay, I believe in this instance, think about it. She saw, she had a vision for Barak. He was a spiritual son. She's saying, hey, I want you to go soar. God has given this, this evil general into your hand. Go take the land, right? And he wasn't ready yet. He didn't see what she was seeing. And so he pulled on her strength as a mother. And he says, you know what? If you go with me, I will go. And I love that she didn't rebuke him for that. She, she understood. I think mothers understand that people are in process, that sons and daughters are in process. But I believe that Deborah had a greater vision for Barak than he had for himself. And she was wanting to release him into it. But um, one of the things that we say in Prophetic Company, we learned from Cletty Keith, I think it was Cletty, right, Dano? Was this, it says, don't submit yourself to a leader who doesn't have a greater vision for your life than you have. I know. So good. I believe as mothers, we need to have greater visions of those that we're called to, to mother our sons and daughters than even they have. You know, and I'm not talking like, 
Like if your son's a drug dealer and you're like, oh, he's in pharmaceuticals. Like, I'm not talking about that. We're not talking like, like beyond what God is saying, but, but we know that, that God's thoughts are higher, more, you know, they're greater. We can't even ask, think, or imagine, right? So mothers, I believe we need to see those that we're mothering the way God sees them, right? And, and, and honestly, sons and daughters need mothers to speak that into their life. They need their strength. My, uh, my sister, I mentioned her earlier, she is also a powerful worship leader and apostolic leader in San Diego. And I remember she told me the story once where um, they were at like a supernatural school, something like that. Her and her son prayed for this young woman um, who had like a back issues and they prayed for her and she got healed, which was awesome. And then um, I almost like am expecting you guys to clap because this place just celebrates like healing all the time. It's so cool. I was like waiting for it. I know you guys are celeb. No, you didn't have to. I know that sounded like I wanted you to now. It was okay. I just love how you guys celebrate healings and what God does. I love that. <clears throat> so anyways, so this young woman gets healed and then, um, and then my, uh, then she shares with my sister. She's like, I've always wanted to like pray for people and get healed. Like I have words about praying for other people and that they would get healed. So my sister being the kingdom mother, she is, she's like, you know what? Come back tonight. We're going to call people forward and you're going to pray and heal people tonight, you know? And so later that evening, this woman comes up and then my sister makes this announcement like, Hey, this young woman got healed today from her back issues. And she's going to pray for you. If anybody here, you know, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If anyone here has back issues, why don't you come forward and and she's going to pray for you and you're going to get healed. So all these people come up and they like line up in front of this lady, right? And so this young woman goes to the first person and she puts her hands and she's praying for their healing, okay? As she's doing that, my sister behind her has her hand like right in her lower back and she's just praying and releasing her strength as a mother over her until that woman gets prayed for and healed. And then they go to the next person and the next person. Are you catching this? She was releasing her strength as a mother so that the battle could be won for this young woman. Mothers remind children of who they are. They persuade them. They remind them. That's another, that's another translation of comfort. It's not just to comfort and nurture, but also to remind or persuade someone. So I believe mothers remind them of who they are. Um, I remember when my son was younger, and again, I'm using some of my natural examples, but I have a lot of examples spiritually as well with people that I've mothered in the kingdom. But my son, when he was younger, his name is Ethan, and his name means strong and steadfast. And when he was wanting to join the Navy, which kind of took me by surprise, um, when he was about to graduate high school and he met a recruiter and he's now he's talking about the Navy. And I just, you know, there's no military people in my family. I just didn't know. Um, I just wanted my boy to be safe, honestly. And so I remember dialoguing with the Lord about this and the Lord reminded me, he's like, you know what? What did you say to your son when he was little, and I remembered when he was younger, he would kind of wrestle too aggressively with his younger sisters, and I would pull him aside. I'd remind him of who he was. His name is Ethan. It means strong and steadfast. I'd say, hey, buddy, God didn't make you strong to be a bully. He made you strong to be a defender of the defenseless. So I would remind him, when the Lord reminded me of what I used to remind my son of, it gave me great peace to know, wow, my son is stepping into the Navy, which of course is the defender of the defenseless. So I knew that that was part of my son's call. But this is part of what we do as kingdom mothers is we remind and persuade our children of who God calls them to be. So we model the vision, we affirm the vision, we assist the vision, and finally, one of my favorites, we accelerate the vision. Kingdom mothers accelerate the vision. I believe mothers are often a catalyst for acceleration of destiny. Okay, again, I'm gonna go back to Mary, uh, which is one of the best examples of this, and we see this in John chapter two. It's just setting the stage. It's that, it's that wedding, right, where they're at the wedding, and 
They run out of wine. And so she turns to Jesus and she has this exchange with Jesus. I want you guys to hear this. In John chapter two, it says, the third day, a wedding took place in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. It's like, she, you know, she knew what she was asking. And Jesus did too, because he's like, woman, why do you involve me? He's like, and this is the thing. He said, my hour has not yet come. And then his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay, I love this exchange. It's like, son, they have no more wine. Like, I want you to do something here because I I believe as a mother, she saw him privately. You know, think about this, guys. She's been treasuring words about Jesus from the time, honestly, from the time of conception. She's been treasuring. She's been watching him. She's affirming. She's assisting. She's seen him grow up into the man of God, not to God himself, right? And to be who he's created to be. And in this moment, she's like, can you turn water to wine? And Jesus is like, my time is not yet come. And it's almost like she didn't even hear him say that because she's like, Just, you know, she turns to the servants like, oh, just do whatever he says, you know? And I love this because, you know, do you realize that Jesus did? He turned the water into wine. Mary accelerated the destiny of Jesus. He said, my hour has not yet come, but there's something about a mother before the heart of the father that pulled Jesus's ministry into the now. And it was his mother that released him into public ministry. Verse 11 says this, this was the beginning of miracles and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So this was the very beginning and it was his mother that accelerated his destiny. You know, Jesus may have done what he saw his father doing, but he sure listened to what his mama said. <laughs> Chris Valentin was the first one to say that. And it was really funny. So, so I, feel, I feel like it's legal. Okay, but she wasn't the only one, you guys. Okay, I just want to share. It's not, it was not an anomaly because we see James and John, mother, right? Sons of thunder. She walked up to Jesus, remember? And she's like, hey, when you come into your glory, will you let one of my sons be at your left and my other son rule with you on your right, right? Do you realize that Jesus didn't rebuke her? Because she had a correct vision, because the Bible talks about us of how those disciples, how those will rule with Jesus. There will be 12 thrones with him. So she had a correct vision, but the wrong application, the wrong manifestation. And Jesus said, hey, that's not mine to give. So, but she was using her influence as a mother to help accelerate her son's destinies. We see this with Naomi and Ruth, right? Naomi was the mother-in-law of Ruth. She, she wasn't even her natural mother, wasn't a biological mother. But Naomi went and she's the one that gave the advice and the counsel to Ruth to go into the field of Boaz. And as a result, Ruth marries Boaz. And we know that the generation of David and Jesus came from that line. Do you really realized that Naomi was the one who helped accelerate Ruth's destiny. Bathsheba and Solomon. When, when Solomon, when David was on his deathbed and one of his sons was parading himself as the new king, it was Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, that went before David and said, did you not say that our son Solomon would be king after you? And David's like, you are right. And it was that day that he made Solomon king over Israel. Are you guys catching this pattern here? Again, I believe that mothers, kingdom mothers, we watch for opportunities to accelerate the destinies of those that were called to influence. But you know what? You can't accelerate destinies if you don't have influence yourself. Which is why, again, it goes back to that first principle. You have to be a world changer so that you can raise a world changer. You can release them. You can use your influence to help steward and accelerate and raise them up to who God has called them to be. And so you guys, today, just as we close, because I know it's Mother's Day, um, I just want to encourage you guys In this season, as never before, there is an urgency for women and mothers to arise to their place next to the fathers in the harvest. Do you guys believe this? 
And again, as I said earlier, what's happening today will not be fixed by government programs, educational systems, or medical breakthroughs. God's solution is for the hearts of mothers and fathers to be turned to their children and the children to be receiving from mothers and fathers. Do you realize that was the very last verse of the Old Testament before 400 years of silence? He said that, the, that Elijah would come, the prophet would come, and he would turn the hearts of the fathers and mothers to their children and their children to their fathers and mothers. Otherwise, the destruction would come. Guys, I feel like destruction is coming. And as a result, it's because of the breakup of the lack of us owning our assignment as fathers and mothers. But today is the day that can all change. Today is the day when we can start shifting into owning this and, and again, start releasing and raising up those God has called us to. So just two calls in my heart. Let's stand really quick. I'm just going to um, just pray two things over you guys before we close. Our first is this. I just want to release, um, for those of you who did not have either a mother or you didn't have a good experience with a mother, I just want to release a mother's blessing over you tonight, today. I just feel as an apostolic mother, I want to release that over you. Um, and so if that's you, you can either raise your hand or put your hand on front. But Father, I just, right now, God, I just want to, I thank you, first of all, Lord, for just the power of family. Father, the power of what you have designed, Lord God, to shape and create uh, your will and your kingdom on earth. And Father, for every person in here, Lord God, who either did not have a mother or did not have a great experience or encounter with mother, Father, first of all, Lord, I just, um, Lord, I just repent on behalf of those mothers that were not there, that were not there, that are either abused or, or abandoned. Lord, I just... I repent on behalf of that. But Father, as a kingdom mother, as an apostolic mother, as a prophet right now, Lord, I release the full force of the mother's blessing on every person in here, Lord God, that Lord, there would be no lack anymore. Those places, those holes, Father God, that were not filled by mother. I just release that grace right now, the mothering grace to fill their hearts, their minds, to even rewire their brain and the way that they're thinking, Lord God, and to rewire even cellular structure. Father, the, the, the areas that has even impacted their health, Lord God, I just pray a grace right now of mothering, just a blessing in Jesus' name in this room. Okay, and finally, Father, I just, I just have this call in my heart for women in this room. I'm calling women who is willing to step into owning this assignment as a kingdom mother for the sake of the harvest to raise up this next generation of world changers to release heavenly identity into sons and daughters so that we can produce godly offspring and we can fill the earth, we can increase, we can take dominion and rule so that Jesus can come back and have his rightful place. So if that's you, I want you to raise your hand and say, I am, I am a woman I'm willing to own. I'm willing to say yes to taking the ownership of mothering world changers, both my own natural children, but it doesn't have to be. It can be those around you. And Father, I just thank you right now for every woman in this room, Lord God, that is stepping into the courage that it takes. You do not have to be qualified. You just need to bring your yes. And Father, I ask, Lord, that, that there would be a move of women that would walk in boldness and courage and the strength of the Lord. And like Deborah, who said, I arise a mother, Lord God, that we would step into, Lord God, this movement of what is happening for the sake of this next generation. And Lord, I pray that even right now, that as the women have their hands raised, Lord, that you would drop faces, you would drop names. Father God, you would reveal to them who they're called to pour this mothering grace into in this season. Okay, I don't want you running around telling people that you're mother. Okay, you guys, you're not, we're not doing that. There is going to be an equal life exchange between you and those that God has called you to pour into. And, um, and so, Father, I thank you right now that you are, you are raising this movement and it's going to be unstoppable. And I just, again, Lord, I bless every mother in this place, both spiritual and natural, Father, that, that you would just... Pour, pour over them with heavenly kisses and grace today. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that we will be this family, fathers and mothers. We will 
turn the tide of this identity crisis in this generation, Father, that we would speak life, Father, to every son and daughter who is so confused, Lord God, that they would come alive to the voice of their heavenly Father, Lord God, so that we can uh, bring your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.